text this morning. <coughs> this may seem to be an odd text when you hear my message this morning, but uh, uh, this was, uh, verse 3 is what I want to really look at, but uh, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Let us pray. Father, we're just thankful for your word this morning. We're thankful for each one that's here. And Lord, for this church, that you're blessing in such a great and powerful way. And I just pray, Lord, that this message will, uh, will be, uh, how shall I say, Lord, at the uh, proper timing and uh, that it'll be appropriate and be helpful to help us each and every one to encourage you, Lord, in your work and in the service that we have committed unto you. So I pray you'd bless this message and that you would help us each and every one. I pray each one here will benefit from it. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I can see it with you. Verse, there's a lot of different things covered here. Well, what a list of things that is the cause of a perilous time. How many knows what the word perilous means? Dangerous. It means dangerous. Dangerous. And you know what? We're living in such a time. We are really living in such a time. And it gives the reason uh, why there would be a dangerous times, why the last days would be dangerous times. And I think that uh, in verse 2, uh, it says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. And actually, that little phrase that I just said kind of sums up the rest of everything that's contained in that setting that I read this morning. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Uh, so that takes in selfishness and uh, greed and, and uh, lust and all kinds of things, doesn't it? So, and there's a, a list of everything. But I want to look at verse 3. It says, without natural affection without natural affection. Uh, now we can apply that to uh, sexual activity uh, and so forth, and I'm sure it's applied like that a lot, but I want to look at something else here this morning with that, and uh, when we look at natural affection, uh, what, what is some of our natural affections? What, uh, uh, what, what comes natural for us? When a woman gives birth to a baby, does she have a natural affection for that baby? She really does, doesn't she? Unless she does something or something in her life causes her to change that affection. But what God has placed within us is uh, love for babies and love for our children, love for our mates. Uh, and so forth, and children having love for their parents, and uh, and so forth. And there's a lot of things that has interfered with that in our society. Uh, and so we are, in, in a lot of areas, we are without natural affection. We don't have the kind of love and the kind of care and concerns that we have by nature, because they have been influenced by a lot of ideas and ideologies and, and so forth and so uh, it has uh, uh, it has changed things uh, I want to go to the book of Titus chapter 2 and I want to read some scripture there and, and uh, something that I think probably all of us or at least most of us here this morning understand and that is the book of first and second Timothy and the book of Titus 
is actually instructions to the ministry. Instructions to the ministry. Okay? Uh, and so as I read in Titus here, I want you to keep that in mind, that this is instruction to the ministry. Uh, and so let's just uh, begin reading in verse 1 here, Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Things that become sound doctrine. And of course, if you read that statement with a lot of people and a lot of churches, you would think that uh, they'd be talking about uh, 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 Christian creeds and, and that sort of thing. But listen to what follows and what Paul is telling Timothy is really sound doctrine. How many knows what the word doctrine means? We're going to look at some definitions here this morning on some things. What does the word doctrine mean? It means teaching. Teachings. So, uh, speak thou the things that become sound teaching. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. So, these are the things Paul is telling Timothy, giving him instruction, these are the things that you are to teach in your church. Titus, I'm sorry, I said Timothy, didn't I? Okay, tell him, tell him Titus. These are the things that ministers are to teach. And I, and, and I just want to, to look at these things. And so what, I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at, uh, at uh, different categories. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to start... I'm going to talk about, uh, about children, young men, young women, uh, aged, I got this backwards, no, aged men and aged women. Now, aged means us older folks, so, uh, and, and, and that's a good thing, really. So, I want to just look at those categories and, and uh uh, see a little bit about what the Word says about these things. And, and, and I want to talk to you this morning about, uh, about these things that Paul was talking to when he wrote it to Titus here. Uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2, uh, this is very familiar with, with all of us this morning. We've always heard this, and, and I know our children all understand this and, and so forth. You know, it's, it's easy to preach this kind of a message this morning. Uh, it, and the reason it is because all the things I, that I'm going to cover is things that is already in place in our congregation, in our people, uh, and it's there. And so I, I just felt like I wanted to preach this to encourage you and to let you know that every one of you is, is important in the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, there is uh, 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 some things that's happening in our society that uh, I think is, uh, it, it is not good at all. And there's things, especially with the older folks in our society, uh, there's an attitude that once a person gets to a certain age that they don't have much value anymore. They're just kind of in the way and they're a burden on society. We have to take care of them and we have to just provide for certain needs that they have and and uh, the list goes on and and we really uh, uh, put a lot of importance on uh, the young people how many has heard statements like if you don't know how to to uh, do something with your smartphone ask your grandchild they'll show you how to 
you know, we've heard that, haven't we? Well, the fact is, there's a lot of truth to that, too, isn't there? There really is. There's a lot of truth to that. And it seems like the younger that people are, the more they understand that uh, and so forth. But uh, does that mean that there's no, that, that, that the older you get, the less value that you have? That's so wrong. That attitude is so wrong. Uh, so let's just take a look here. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So, uh, why should children obey their parents? Well, I want to I share something with you that, uh, that took place one time. Uh, I was called on in a family situation where there was a, a pretty serious problem between a young lady and her parents. And she was rebellious and she just didn't want to do what her parents uh, wanted her to do. And she, uh, she just rebelled against all kinds of things and, and she just didn't think her parents knew anything or, or, or whatever. And so I tried talking with her and talking to the parents and whatever. And finally, I wasn't getting anywhere in talking to this young lady. Uh, and she was, uh, I think, a sophomore in high school or somewhere right around that age. And so finally I said, uh, I want to I wanna ask you a question. I said, uh, you, you, uh, you think that you've got everything you know what, what uh, life is all about, and you think you've got everything, you understand all these things that we've talked about and everything. I said, I just want to ask you a question. Do you, are you smarter than a, than a sixth grader? And this young lady, she, she just, that really took her by surprise to ask her that. And then she looked at me and she said, well, of course I am, they're stupid or something of that nature. I forget the exact words that she said. And I said, why are you smarter than a sixth grader? Well, they just don't know anything. And I said, did you not know anything when you was a sixth grader? And she said, well, yeah, I knew some things. I said, well, okay. So I talked about that for a few minutes, and I said, now, I said, I want to tell you something. I said, you are, and I get whatever age she was, 14 or 15, whatever age. And I said, you're this age. You was once a sixth grader. You have progressed, and you have learned, and so forth, until you're at the place you're at now. And so you do know more than a sixth grader. But I want you to realize something. Your mom and dad, they used to be a sophomore. They used to be sixth graders. So have they become stupid because they got older? And I said, no. The fact is, they have continued to learn just like you have continued to learn since you was a sixth grader. And now they have continued to learn. Don't you think that they know some things and understand life and things in such a way that they can help you actually and you're growing up and, and so forth? Uh, uh, so the bottom line really is your parents are smarter than you, whether you want to accept that or not. Well, you know what? Her attitude changed when I explained it like that uh, and and so it, it's the same way as we go through life the older we get the more we learn the more we understand not just the academics in life but the more we understand as far as life the values of different things and and uh, what uh, what really brings happiness and contentment and what brings joy and peace and so forth and uh, do, do, is it a, a wonder that there is a limits, age limits on certain things in our country when our country was formed? Why didn't they, why did they put an, an age limit on becoming president of the United States? In other words, how old do you have to be to run for the president of the United States? 35. 35. Okay, so you have to be 35 to run for the president. How old do you have to be to vote? Well, it's 18 now, but when the Constitution was made, it was 21. 
uh, and so forth. They want, the, the founders of our country was, was wise men. They really was, for the most part. They were very intelligent, very wise men. And they seen that you needed to, to reach a certain place of maturity in order to be knowledgeable enough and so forth to vote or to be president and so forth. So age limits was set because of that. And so the older we get, the more uh, valuable we are because the more we have learned and so forth. So uh, uh, children, obey your parents. Why? Because your parents have been here a lot longer than you have and they've learned a lot more than you have. And so they're in a place that they understand things better. Does that mean that they are always right and they always have the correct answer and solution? No, it's not. Uh, they're not always right. And I wasn't always right when I was raising my children and so forth. And Betty Sue will say amen to that, I'm sure. But anyway, we parents make mistakes and, and, uh, and, and just like everybody else does. Okay, so that's the instruction for children. To obey your parents, let them give you instructions in growing up. The next thing I want to look at is young men. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself as a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Uh, we look at the word sober and we think, well, that means to not become intoxicated. That's the normal use. And actually the words, the, the Greek words that was used in the Bible and most of the time that's what it means too but to be sober it has another meaning to it and that is it means to be vigilant to be vigilant okay so young men uh, uh, don't be uh, how do I what's the words I want to use here don't be uh, carried about with every thought and idea and wind of doctrine and so forth be vigilant stay on track uh, and then it says, uh, uh, have good works in gravity. Now, the word in the King James here is gravity. That basically means honesty. That's what gravity means, be honest. And so these are some things that young men uh, should be taught uh, to achieve in their lives. The instructions that uh, Paul gave to Titus here. Uh, younger women. Younger women. Now I know that uh, this, the, the, where a lot of problems arise in the lives of people is when they change from being a child to become an adult. Uh, there's a lot of changes takes place and people in that age group, they don't really understand a lot of things. They're faced with new things, new ideas, new challenges, new responsibilities and a lot of things and so they need instruction and that's why we need good homes and so forth but here's what it says in first timothy chapter 5 and verse 14 i will therefore that the younger women marry bear children guide the house give more give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully now that's instructions to young women I know that uh, uh, the, uh, the one thing that, uh, uh, no, I'll wait till I get to it, I'm not there yet. Okay, so that's instructions directly to the young women. Uh, so that's basically the role that God intended for women. Now we live in a society where it, it's, uh, it's politically correct for girls to grow up and to uh, get an education, get as much education as they can and, and start a career of some kind and, uh, and uh, you know, make a lot of money and so forth. And then when they get to be uh, 28 or 30 years old, get married and start having some children and, and so forth. And that's kind of the pattern that has been established in our society. No wonder that uh, families in our society is not reproducing fast enough to keep up with the population. We have a population growth in this country only because of immigration. We are actually losing uh, 
the, the number wise in population, if we had no in, no immigration in this country, we would we would decrease and decrease and decrease in population. Well, that's not what God intended. Uh, so says the younger women to marry, bear children, guide the house. I really like that. Guide the house. Uh, you know, uh, and and that's a big responsibility. It really is a huge responsibility. Give not occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. All right. We could look at, I uh, uh, thought about looking at, at Proverbs 31 this morning, but uh, for the sake of time, I chose not to do that. Uh, so, let's go a step further. The next uh, category I want to look at is the aged men. The aged men, and it says that uh, the aged men are to be sober. That word's coming up quite a bit, so it really applies to all of us. So we are to be vigilant. Uh, they are to be grave. Now we use the word grave uh, a little bit different. That's a place where you bury people when this life is over, but uh, that's not what this is talking about, and that's not the meaning here. Uh, to be grave means to be honorable or to be honest. You know, there's, there's more in the Bible than most Christians think that there is as far as character building is concerned. There's a lot in the Word of God about character building, and we need to really give heed to that and, and really build our character and become the kind of people that God wants us to be. The next attribute that the aged men should have, they are to be temperate, or ministry is to teach them to be temperate. To be temperate means self-controlled, to have self-control. Uh, that's so important that we need to really understand that it's not always easy, and, and all these things are not always easy, but these are the things now, what, what I'm, my thought in mind in preaching this message this morning uh, is to encourage all of you because I see these, these attributes in the lives of people in our church. I see that they are there and uh, they are taking place. I believe we've got good, strong Christian character in our church. But I want to encourage you this morning uh, and don't let anybody... Uh, put you down or, or uh, give you cause to think that you're not a valuable individual and that you are have not achieved anything in your walk with the Lord. So let's continue here. The aged men need to be sound in faith. Sound in our faith. And we all need that, don't we? Not just the aged men, but uh, here it's applied to the men. Uh, sound in charity. Uh, I have it's interesting what I have noticed in life as far as finances and, and, uh, uh, and personal possessions and things. Now, this doesn't always apply, but I have found, generally speaking, that people that are not charitable do not succeed financially. Let me give you an example. I worked in line work for 39 years. Climbed power poles, worked on the power lines, worked a lot of high voltage almost daily uh, in, in, uh, in my line work that I did for those 39 years. I worked for different contractors out of our union hall. The contractor, there was two contractors, one was called EE e. Electric and the other one was called Polk and Steinle, and both of those contractors was commonly known as contractors that poor boy things. Everybody know what it means to poor boy something? Get by just as cheap as you possibly can, just patch it together, make it hold up, and just do as little as you can, and, and, uh, and, and so forth. And I will tell you, those two contractors that poor boy things, they had the most accidents and made the less money of any contractors on our home. And I find it works that way in personal life. It doesn't pay to buy a cheap tool that's going to break on you. It pays to buy a good tool that's going to last you for the rest of your life. 
and that's the way that, uh, that, that we should think. And we should think that way spiritually, and we should think that way when we minister to others. We need to be generous people. God's people does. And I've seen a lot of generosity amongst the people in our church. I really have. Uh, and and I've, I've been really surprised, to tell you the truth, a few times at the generosity of the people in our church and people that, uh, that it, it didn't appear to me could really afford to be generous, and yet they was. And God blessed us because of that. Uh, we need to be sound in patience. Sound in patience. Don't let circumstances and things upset you if they're not going as fast as what you uh, would like them to. But uh, just uh, just be patient and really depend on the Lord and trust God to really take care of your needs and supply what you have uh, need of. So that's the end of the list for aged men. So now we're going to talk about old women. Bible calls you aged women. See, I can talk like this now that I'm an old man. <laughs> and I tell people that I'm not really old. I've just been here a while. And that's the way I feel because mentally I'm really not old. I'm young at heart. And I still like to do things and go places and as much as my physical strength will allow me anyway. So when it talks about uh, uh, women, uh, here's what it says. Behavior as become of holiness, not false accusers, uh, not given to much wine, teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Okay? So let's look at these things. Uh, behavior as becometh holiness. Now I could go to the fourth chapter of Ephesians, chapter 25 through 29, and it will give us a list of all the things that pertains to holiness. Uh, I was raised in, a, in, a, in churches. We moved around a lot as I grew up, went to a lot of different churches, and and there were some of them that was called holiness churches and, and uh, so forth. And holiness in the churches I grew up in, and there's still some churches today that's like that. It's all about how you dress and, and uh, how much makeup women wears. In fact, in most of those churches, they wasn't allowed to wear it, use any makeup or any jewelry or ever cut their hair or uh, had to wear long sleeves and, and dresses and couldn't wear pants or slacks or anything like that or shorts or none of that. I mean, it was something else. Men couldn't have long hair. I never did, could figure out when hair becomes long. What is the difference? At what point is hair long or short? I never did quite figure that out. But uh, anyway, this was all these teachings. And if you followed all these teachings, you're going to go to heaven. And if you didn't, you're going to go to hell. And all the list went on. And it was a, a major fear <laughs> tactic that they was used. And uh, you know what? The Bible says the goodness of God leads us to repentance. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. But the Bible in Ephesians 4, it starts out by talking about true holiness. True holiness. And what I was raised in is false holiness. I just want to go on record as saying that today that's false holiness. Now I can take you to a church in Carson City really into that. You ought to see the way they dress and, and so forth. We, we met some at uh, Denny's one night, didn't we? And uh, boy, I mean, you could spot them a mile away. Uh, and they're proud of that, by the way. Well, you know, the Bible says that, you know, they think, well, I, they can tell I'm a Christian just by looking at me. Well, the Bible says not to judge according to appearance. Did you know the Bible said that? The Bible said that. Jesus himself said that. And, and so did Paul in Corinthians. Okay, but I believe in holiness. And I don't believe that anybody's going to make it to heaven without holiness. True holiness. True holiness. So I'll let you look this up later. I'm not going to take the time. Our time is moving right along here this morning. But Ephesians 4, verses 25 to 29 is true holiness. 
okay, women, older women, don't be false accusers. Don't be given to much wine. Be teachers of good things. Here's your ministry, at least partially, in the church. Your ministry is to teach young women. Teach them to be sober. Teach them to love their husbands. Teach them to love their children. Teach them to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. I, I uh, was asked to do a wedding one time, and, and this lady was telling me that, uh, and these were church-going uh, a couple that wanted to get married and had been uh, going to church on a regular basis and, and so forth, and this lady said, in the wedding ceremony, I don't want you to say to, to ask me to promise to obey my husband. So you don't want a Christian wedding then. Well, I mean, that's, that's the word, isn't it? Now, that doesn't mean that the men has a right to abuse their, uh, their wives. Uh, you know, these things. We all understand this. I don't have to go into this. We all understand that. But anyway, uh, teach the young women that the word of God is not to be blasphemed. Um, so, this is, is uh, instructions that Paul gave to Titus that he was to teach his people. Now, here's something that I think we really need to understand. We need to understand that these things, and, and I could add a lot more to it, but this is the basics of Christianity. They really are. They're the, God wants to change our lives. He wants to make us to be wholesome, credible people with good characters. And I, I, I just want to say this this morning, especially for the older people, but for the younger people also, you are valuable. You're valuable people. Jesus said that you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And without the characteristics, the attributes, and so forth, that exist within the lives of Christian people, society would be a lot worse off than it is today. You talk about the, the, the things that's going on and the killings and the... The, the, the crime and, and drive-by shootings and, and the drug problems and all the things that's going on today in the world. I'll tell you, it would be many times worse if we did not have the element of Christianity. Did you know that there's a lot of people that are not Christians that practice the attributes of Christianity? There really is. And it's because of those attributes is what makes our society as good a society as that it is what it is. And so, uh, when we get older, I'm not going to let anybody put me over on a, on a shelf someplace and say, uh, you have reached a certain age, and so you're not valuable anymore. I know a pastor that when I first met him, he was 62 years old, and he, and he announced this at our minister's meeting. He said, I'm 62, so in three years... I have to have my church prepared for a new pastor because that's the age of retirement. Well, that's been, what, 12, 14 years ago. He's still pastoring. <laughs> and he has told us a couple times, I have really thought about resigning the church and getting a new pastor, but he said, you know what? He said, God just won't let me do that. Amen. Well, God doesn't have an age to retire. Uh, and, and I tell you, and I'm just going to be honest with you this morning, I'm glad he doesn't. I'm glad I'm still pastoring. I like pastoring, and and uh, I love our church, and I, I think this is such a great thing, and, and uh, I, I just appreciate so much what God is doing amongst our people. And so I just want to let you know this morning that uh, when you reach a certain age, that you're still valuable. In fact, the older you get, the more valuable you are. And that's a fact because you have gained experience. You have gained knowledge and understanding 
uh, you understand more about how people feel and, 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 and a lot of different things. Uh, did you know the Bible uh, talks, tells uh, the young ministry not to be a novice? We should be, now I didn't do this, but we should be uh, mature and have some knowledge about what we're doing before we ever get into actively into the ministry. I believe that there's a time that we need to go through to get prepared and get ready for the ministry. The Bible says to, to lay hands suddenly on no man. So we should have a time to prepare ourselves and there's been a lot of young men that has that has taken churches to pastor them and, and I know the reason this happens a lot because of the need that's out there uh, and so forth and but a lot of young men has taken churches and has just really caused damage in the body of Christ and so forth because they wasn't knowledgeable and so forth and so uh, the one thing that I did when I took my first church I I wasn't really young I think I was 28 uh, or 29 something like that when I pastored my first church and uh, uh, Betty Sue was just a baby uh, then and, and in fact uh, Johnny her brother was born while I was pastoring that church and uh, so I took that church and, and I really was not prepared but I took that church under the condition that there was a, a, a minister that was a lot more seasoned and knowledgeable and everything than what I was I took it under the condition that he would be my assistant and help me in that and so at least I did that much but I was really a novice at that time and I've learned one or two things since then uh, so uh, I want to be the best pastor that I can be but I have found that the most important thing in pastoring is to is to trust God and to teach all of you to trust in God because God is really where it's at it's not in me it's in God and so when we look at, at all of these attributes and all these things we've talked about this morning, uh, determine to apply them to your life if you haven't already. I feel like most of us already have, or at least determined that we're on, on our way to do that and so forth. And uh, just keep on serving the Lord and doing as God has called you to. And, uh, and, and don't let anybody give you the idea that you have outlived your usefulness. There's none of us that has. We're valuable and, and uh, you know, so, so what if you're 60, 70, 80 years old? I don't think there's anybody here that's 80 yet. Uh, I'm, it's scary how close I'm getting, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, but the, the fact is, you've been around a while and there's a lot of times when the younger folks are gonna face situations that they don't understand, they don't know how to deal with it, and you can be there to advise them, to counsel with them, and to to and you'll be a, just a great blessing. And no matter how old you are, you're never going to be too old to minister to others and to be a blessing to others. So keep that in mind, and don't let anybody take that away from you. You're valuable. God wants you, and God needs you in the body of Christ. So let us stand this morning.